Welcome to the Louisville Probate Law Podcast with Attorney Scott Shanest. He'll provide helpful information about wills, power of attorney documents, and other issues related to probate law in Kentucky. These tips and easy-to-understand conversations can save you time, money, and stress related to a topic each of us will eventually have to face. Let's join Scott for today's episode. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back in the studio with Louisville attorney Scott Shanest, and today we're going to be talking about issues that come up in estate planning and wills and especially probate. Today, specifically, we're going to talk about dispensing with probate or ways to kind of avoid the probate process, potentially. Scott, welcome back to the studio, guy. Good to see you again, Jim. Absolutely. Hey, I, I like this um, I like this topic a lot because, one, you handled all of my estate planning documents. <laughs> I mean, I like, to, I like to tell people that I trust you that much that I gave all of this over to you and said, hey, please help me make sure I've got these documents in place. So I, I trust you with this. I, I like your, your approach to this. But... Um, this is an, an issue that a lot of people don't understand, I think, when, when you're dealing with, you know, what is probate, first of all, and, and right. what's an estate. So let, let's let's start there, if you don't mind. In general terms, what is probate? Well, pro- probate, the process, is really designed to get a uh, title for some kind of a property, bank account, car, real estate, that was in the decedent's name to the proper party. Okay, spouse, so someone spouse. someone dies, right. they, they've got some assets, That's, and this is the legal way to convey that right, to... Right, right, because that decedent no longer has title, not a, able to take care of it, they're not using it. So probate the process, and every state's designed this way, is designed to get that property that's in that decedent's name into the right, the right hands. Now, this subject today with the dispense with probate is really designed to deal with what, what I call smaller estates, generally estates $30,000 or less. And this is a... A Kentucky shortcut that um, allows people to avoid uh, the time and expense of opening up a normal probate file and dispense with small estates. Um, there's a lot of caveats to this. You, you can't do it with every estate. In general, it has to be an estate $30,000 or less. It has to be an estate where that $30,000 is going to go to a spouse or to, if there's no spouse, to children of the decedent. It's not going to apply if you've got uh, parents, if you've got brothers and sisters that would be the people that would be inheriting property underneath the law of Kentucky. Uh, but for people that have an estate worth less than $30,000, a small estate, we have a process where we can dispense with probate in the state of Kentucky. Well, you know, I always thought when we're talking about rich people, when we're talking about estates, it would be much more than $30,000. But that's not the legal meaning of what an estate is, right? Right. And this is what, another thing that I think shocks a lot of people. What what actually is an estate? Well, uh, the, the way I'm going to use the term estate today is property that's owned in the decedent's name when they die. Um, that's not going to be joint property because joint property, and this, this is how most people own their house with their spouse. They own it jointly. And joint property, when one of the people that owns it dies, it automatically becomes the survivor's property. So most people in Kentucky own the house jointly with their spouse, and typically when the first spouse passes away, the surviving spouse is now the owner. There's not anything that has to be done because the deed has been set up that way. You don't have to go to probate. I'll get a call once every two months from uh, you know a nice lady whose husband passed away recently. She wants to get the house in her name. Well, the house is already in her name if he's passed away. And when she sells it, she just essentially signs an affidavit that he passed away on a certain date, and everybody understands now why he didn't sign it. We call that an affidavit of sin. So for an estate, it's property that's owned just in the decedent's name when they die. Again, joint property is not part of that estate. Other things that aren't part of that would be trust. If somebody has a lot of money, a lot of times they'll create a trust. And what they do is they transfer that property out of their name, and they put it into the trust name. And it's they called funding the trust. Funding the trust. Now, they're beneficiaries of the trust, but they don't own the trust. They may be able to exert control over the trust. They may be the trustee of the trust that determines how this stuff is invested and spent and things like that, but they are not technically, technically the owner of the trust. And a lot of people that have a lot of money will create trust for this very purpose is to get the money out of their name into the trust name, who now becomes the owner. So once it's transferred to the trust, that's not part of that person's estate any longer. The trust now controls this. And they do that for different reasons. Number one, they don't have to go through probate because now the trust is the owner. Number two, it keeps people from knowing their business because the trust is not a public document like probate is. Number three, a lot of times it can prevent inheritance taxes, especially for large estates. Uh, I'm not going to get into inheritance taxes today. Right, and number, right. number four, it also gives them some benefits in case somebody 
becomes incompetent and unable to take care of their affairs and give somebody a, a way to take care of those things for them without having to have a guardian or well, conservator appointed in court. And what's really interesting about when people, you, you mentioned when people become in, incompetent, that's not just due to dementia at age. I mean, they could be in a car wreck and suddenly they've had a brain injury of some yeah, sort that, and, that, and, and you get into these situations. So, you know, this kind of conversation is, is a critical conversation to have. Yeah. Um, that's, a whole bunch of other things that yeah. trust. That's the reasons why you should have a trust. Yeah. Why you should have power of attorneys, living with directives, all those kind of things. Um, but today, just for the purposes of getting rid of a small state, um, it's important to know in the state of Kentucky. And let me give you the reasoning behind this. In the state of Kentucky, we have a, a thing the legislature has created called a spousal exemption. Um, the legislature has determined that a spouse, husband or wife, doesn't have to be the wife any longer. It can be used by the husband. The spouse to the decedent has the right to the first $30,000 of personal property of that decedent's estate. And I, I think the reasoning behind this was back in the 1800s, they didn't want the, the owner of the farm going down, going down to town, having a poker game, you know, and selling all the assets right, on right. the farm away. And then he dies and the spouse has got no place to live. So we now have a spousal exemption. It used to be $10,000. It recently increased to $30,000. And again, this gives the spouse the first $30,000 of that estate. So we can use this for a spouse. We can also use this if there's no spouse for the children of the decedent. And this gives people that have an estate of $30,000 or less an avenue to get those assets transferred to the spouse or the children without having to go through the formal process of probate. There's still files that have to be created uh, at the courthouse. We still have to file a petition to dispense with probate. Um, and you still have to have a judge sign off on it, but the costs are a lot less, the time is a lot less, um, and the aggravation is a lot less. Well, that makes sense. Now, you said at the outset that if we have a a house that we're, you know, the, the John and Jane Doe are both on the deed, they, they both own the own the, own the the property, that automatically goes to the surviving spouse. If so if John Pat, you, you, yeah, again. Um, I'm assuming that's like most houses that are owned by spouses in Kentucky, that it's joint ownership with right of survivorship. Mm -hmm. And now, to be certain of that, we have to look at the deed. Every now and then, in a rare case, I'll see where that's not occurred. Right, or maybe somebody right. owned property before they got married, or they were going to get through a divorce or something happened like that. But most people, when they buy a house with a spouse, they don't even have to say anything. Usually the closing attorney is going to set it up as joint ownership with right or survivorship. Well, that makes sense. But, yeah. but since we're talking about estates less than $30,000, yeah. that, that really is talking about the de the person who passed, the decedent, right. is talking about their assets that are not right. jointly right. owned, and, correct? And the reason we're talking about this joint ownership with right or survivorship yeah. with the house yeah. is because generally that takes the house out of, out of the estate. And that means that house, even though it might be worth $100,000, dollars dollars right, right. dollars is not really part of the decedent's estate because that passed to their spouse when they when they when they, when they, when they, when they died. So what we're generally looking at, and most people own almost all their property jointly with the spouse. They have bank accounts jointly. I'm assuming the house's furniture is owned jointly. They got together. Um, what I generally see is maybe there might be a bank account somebody forgot about when they were single, or usually what it is is there's a car because the husband <laughs> liked to trade, and almost always the husband's the one that first passes away. And only the husband is the one that has, you know. Likes you know, to tinker around. Like to tinker around or deal with the car salesman. So a lot of times it's easier, you know, for the husband just to put it in his name. That way he doesn't have to have anybody sign off on when he sells it. So I'll have, you know, a nice lady come in and they've got a $20,000 Cadillac that's in the husband's name because he dealt with the cars. Everything else was owned jointly. The house was jointly. You know, they have life insurance, pension plans, 401ks, which also usually pass outside of the estate. Those usually go to the beneficiaries. Those are usually not included. Again, you've got to look at the exact title and who the beneficiary is, but almost always those are going to be outside of the state. So we usually have a situation with a spouse that owns everything jointly, but maybe this one car, or maybe there's this one stock they got, or, right. or you know, something, gun collection, I don't know. Um, and if it's worth less than $30,000, then what we can do is we can use that spousal exemption to transfer that property to the spouse. Again, if there's no spouse, then we can use that to transfer it to the children. Um, we can't do this if the estate has an estate that's worth more than $30,000, with an exception I'll get to in a minute. But if it's worth th more than $30,000, without this exception I'm going to get into in a minute, get into in a minute, then we got to go the full-fledged probate process. We've got to, you know, get a bigger filing fee. We've got to file more documents. We've got to have a court hearing where I've got to show up as attorney and get the administrator executor appointed. We've got to probate the will. 
you know, we've got to keep the estate open for six months to give creditors a chance to file proof of claims. We've got to file a settlement. There's a lot that goes into it. it well, it is. And depending on how much is in the estate, that means there's more things that have to be done, which increases the amount of time I have to spend, which increases the amount of cost of the estate. So we want to avoid that if we can. So the first thing we look at in any state that comes through the door is, can we dispense with, prop, with probate? Because if we do, we're saving that person a whole lot of time, headache, and more importantly, money. Um, so if we can dispense with probate, we want to do that. We try to see how exactly how everything's titled. Hopefully, you know, it's set up to where everything was joint ownership. If there's all joint ownership, there's really not anything to do with probate. But if there is that one asset, bank account, car, um, and it's worth less than $30,000, then we'll file a petition to dispense with probate, which is basically a smaller filing fee, and we've got to fill out a form. We give it to the judge. They sign off on it. Once that, once that petition to dispense with probate is approved by a judge, then you now have a court order, and let's say it's a car. That car is listed on that. You can now take that to the clerk's office and show the clerk, here's where the judge says this should be transferred to me. And then the clerk will then change the title for that car to whoever the, the petition states it should be changed to. So for small estates, especially those $30,000 or less, where, you know, the... The heirs are going to be either the spouse or the children. We can't use this if the uncle is the only surviving. Yeah, this doesn't apply to siblings no. uh, of, of the or, person yeah, who passed. It, it has to be either the spouse, and if there's no spouse, then the children. Um, if we can, if we can get an estate worth less, less than thirty thousand dollars and dispense with probate, we want, we want to do that because it's just so much faster and easier. Now, the exception I was talking about before is we can add a preferred creditor to the $30,000 exemption. Who's the preferred creditor? The preferred creditor is somebody that's paid for the funeral expense. In Kentucky, um, the spouse is not required to pay for the funeral expense. And I have a lot of people come in and say, well, I didn't pay for it, the life insurance paid for it. I said, well, you, know, you signed off on life insurance and gave it the funeral home, didn't you? You were the beneficiary. That was actually money that you paid for the funeral expense that you were not required to, so you are now a preferred creditor for the estate. Even though the life insurance may made the decedent's funeral possible, you are now the person that should be the beneficiary and you are a preferred creditor of the estate. So, But, the, but, but that opens up an access for that, that surviving spouse to maybe claim a little bit of that, exactly, that money, exactly. which also kind of helps them increase beyond the $30,000. Yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. What, what that does is, let's say the funeral expenses was about, were about $10,000 and it was paid by the spouse, we can now add that $10,000 to the $30,000 before. Okay, so I've got John Doe and Jane Doe. Right. John Doe passes. Right. Jane survives. Right. John has a, a little um, account over here, a bank account that's got, let's say, $50,000 in it. Right. She, Jane can automatically say, I'm going to use, I'm gonna, you know, use this exemption to, to get in there, and I can claim the $30,000. Right. And then because I'm a preferred creditor for that $10,000 I spent on the funeral, I get reimbursed. So now out of that fifty. dollars I get the 30 plus another 10. Yeah. And again, we're still outside of probate. Well, yeah, there's still maybe in that scenario, $50,000 in the bank and $10,000 left that has to go through probate. And there might be some ways to get around that. But, but, um, if, if the, say the funeral expenses were, um, $20,000. Okay. And we added that on to probate as a preferred creditor on top of the $30,000. And that would wipe out that $50,000 in the bank. Right. Right. Now, um, we also use this, $30,000 exemption in a regular probate file where there might be creditors. For instance, there might be a decedent who owed $100,000 and um, in debt, and they only had maybe you know $50,000 in the bank account. Well, the spouse can claim this exemption, and she gets that first $30,000 of the fifty, dollars which leaves effectively $20,000 for the creditors now. Now, if she also paid, I'm assuming it's a she, uh, funeral expenses, and she could also claim that too. So if she paid ten thousand dollars in funeral expenses, she can add that on. So she's getting forty thousand of the fifty, which means that in a insolvent estate, there's only ten thousand dollars to be split up against the creditors. And there's other ways too that we might be able to diminish that ma that amount. For instance, she may be entitled to a fee for her work as the administrator executor of the estate, where she gets paid a fee for it. Uh, there's also other expenses that have to be incurred too. Um, so, um, you know, in, in, in a regular estate where it's actually worth more than $50,000, especially in an insolvent estate, we can use this to make sure that the spouse gets as much money as possible. 
And that's really the purpose behind this, is to make sure the spouse gets as much money as possible. That's why the legislature put this out there. They don't want the spouse being left high and dry. So um, this is really good for um, estates that are worth less than $30,000. Um, but again, it has to be where we only have a spouse or children. We can't use it for the uncle or cousins or siblings, like you said. Uh, and it also can be used in a regular estate where it's insolvent, where we're trying to get as much money as possible to the, uh, the spouse or the children. Um, I, it, it took me a couple years as an attorney. I remember somebody, first year I practiced, I didn't even know about this. They had $200 in a bank account. And they go, you know, this is back in the 80s, and, you know, why should I go to probate court? It's going to cost me $1,000 to get all this going. And, and I'll be honest with you, at the time, I didn't even know about this. Um, but this is that perfect situation where there's just a couple hundred dollars in the bank. You know, you take this form, you fill it out. There's a $50 filing fee, something like that you got to give the court. You sit back and get the order back from the court, and then you take it to the bank, and you have the assets turned over to you. If it's a car, you have that turned over to you. But but typically what I see is is a couple, a married couple. Um, typically, unfortunately for us men, the man dies first. A lot of times the man likes to trade with cars. And there's a $10,000, $15,000 car floating around out there that's just in his name. Could be a fishing boat. Could, Could be, be all Same thing for boats, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any asset less than $30,000. And, you know, everything else was owned jointly. The house was owned jointly. All the other bank accounts were owned jointly. You know, so all those joint assets passed to the surviving spouse on, on the decedent's death. And we're just left with this one asset. This gives us a way to transfer that asset to the decedent without going the full-fledged probate process. Save them a lot of time. Save them a lot of aggravation, but more importantly, save them a lot of money. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and Scott, you know, I started off this episode with you talking about how, you know, you had taken care of, you know, my my will and in, in setting up health care directives and all, all the other stuff that you do for people. That's actually a significant part of your practice. Yeah, this we do a lot of probate work. Um, we do a lot of uh, will planning and uh, power of attorneys and living will directives also. Um, these are some of the conversations sometimes we'll have with folks ahead of time. Um, my experience though has been most people that, that most people in Kentucky have already set up everything jointly. And, and usually, like I said before, if they buy a house, the attorney's almost always going to put it in their names unless they say something else. So a lot of times when people get married, they'll turn the bank accounts over to joint ownership too. You know, a lot of people will buy the cars in joint names, you know, and or, um, they'll do a lot of those things ahead of time. Um, and there's always that one little thing, it seems like, at the end of this that comes through where somebody forgot about this stock, somebody forgot about this, you know, 65 Mustang convertible. You know, there's something out there that just everybody literally forgot about or just might be floating around or maybe this scene may have owned before you even got married. And this gives a great way to get rid of that without having to go through probate. Uh, and again, this is the first thing we look for is to see if we can use this method of dispensing with probate to avoid the entire probate process. There's other methods like that in other states. Um, Indiana's got some processes too. They call them by different names. They've got different amounts. Um, but, but again, this is a great way to avoid going to probate court and uh, uh, the time and expense involved in it is probably even better than, than the money you're saving because you don't have to keep everything open. You don't have to deal with the court. Don't have to deal with attorneys like me. We just do it one time and it's over with. Right, right. Fairly straightforward in, in, in a lot of these cases. I mean, there's always something, but that makes it. You know, one, one thing that I found very interesting, you, you've got a website that's been active for a long time. It's Shanest Law, S-C-H-E-Y-N-O-S-T, law.com. And on there, you actually have a will package, which is kind of interesting. Do you want to take a minute to talk yeah, about we, that? Yeah, we've got a will package where we'll um, set this up for an individual or a couple. Uh, where we'll do a will, a power of attorney, simple will, simple power of attorney, and, and simple living will directive, uh, uh, which I call the triumvirate, triumvirate of what you need uh, of, of planning documents. Um, uh, obviously, everybody, I think, understands what a will is. Um, and, uh, again, um, a will will take care of your property when you die, direct where it goes, and make the administration of your state a lot better. Uh, but most people don't understand much about a power of attorney and, and living will directive. And, and to me, the power of attorney is probably more important than all three of these documents because that gives you a document where you can name an agent to take care of business affairs for you um, while you're alive. It's designed to help you while you're alive. The will is designed to help your estate and your children and heirs and uh, help in the administration of the estate, but you're gone. The power of attorney is actually designed to help you while you're alive. 
And as we all get older, the chances of being sick and in the hospital or nursing home increase greatly. Um, it's sometimes harder to get out to do things. Sometimes people want to take a vacation for a couple of weeks or even months. Uh, a power attorney lets you delegate authority to take care of business affairs of somebody else. Um, it can become effective as soon as you sign it, which is generally the preferred method, I think. You only want to do it with somebody you trust. I tell folks it's like handing the cars to your house, uh, keys, I'm sorry, keys to your heart, car, your house to somebody. You only want to do it with, with somebody you trust because you can actually give them the authority to sell your house or your car. Um, but at the same time, if you've got a close family member, a spouse, a child, or anybody else that you trust with that authority, it can be a great thing. It can avoid having to um, have a guardian appointed for you. Um, it can help transact business a lot faster. Um, and I would recommend that more than the will, like I said before. And I would also recommend that you do that uh, before you do a will because I, I can get a call about once every two weeks, it seems like now, about somebody that needs a power of attorney, but it might be too late to get one. Because maybe they're not mentally competent, or maybe they're incapacitated. Maybe they're in a coma. Yeah, they can't really. They they may be at the point where it's too late to actually, you know, delegate that authority because they don't have the capacity to 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 delegate it because they don't know exactly what they're doing. You know, and this this for me was a big factor. You know, when we first started talking about that, is you know, I understand when I get older, maybe dementia or Alzheimer's or some something else like that could set in, but I could be in a car wreck tomorrow. And, and that's, you know, having these documents in place now, yeah. you know, it's not and, something we plan for. And your spouse doesn't automatically have authority to sign your name. I thought that was really interesting when yeah, you told me that. Yeah, most people are underneath the misconception that, that that's the law, but that's not the law. You, you, you can't sign your spouse's name to document. That's not allowed. Yeah. Um, you know, once we got rid of uh, female servitude back in the 1700s, all that stuff changed. Um, but uh, both of you... Um, if they, if you need to sign a document, one of you is not going to be present. You need a power of attorney to do that. And again, it's, it's better to do that now before things get to the point where you can't sign it. Um, and there's all kinds of situations where this can be helpful, even with somebody that's not, not older. If you, you know, going to go out of town, if you're going to be in the military and assign, you know, a, a post for a couple of months, if, if you've got a long-term project out of town, um, you can sign a power of attorney unless your spouse take care of business. You know, maybe interest rates go down from 5% to 2%. Who knows? If you've got a spouse with power of attorney, they can do that refinancing for you. So it, it's all kinds of situations where it can be helpful. And usually when you need it, uh, if somebody's incapacitated, it's usually too late to get it. Right. So I, I recommend that more than the other documents. And then we had talked about the Living Will Directive also allows somebody to take care of your health care decisions for you. It's almost like a power of attorney for health care decisions. It's kind of end-of-life decisions, right? Or even if you're you're not able to talk to the doctors and it's not end-of-life, you know, what side am I going to have uh, the skin graft taken care of from, you know, do I really want this kind of medication? Um, you're delegating that authority to somebody else to make decisions for you. But, again, that's that's the main purpose for it is end-of-life decisions probably. Um, and you can name somebody to make those decisions for you. You can give specific directions. Um, that's, that's very helpful for you. And, uh, you know, all those, all those documents cover most of the stuff that might come up. There's other things that can always be helpful, like trust to help you prevent from um, having to have uh, Medicare uh, issues come up or tax issues. Um, a lot of people anymore now with, with the inheritance tax don't really have to worry about that in Kentucky. The federal inheritance tax is about $12 million, um, which means there's an exemption for stuff underneath that. Uh, usually there's no Kentucky inheritance tax if the uh, money's being uh, left to a close relative like a spouse or children. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that can come up. We're happy to discuss all these with you, but that will package questionnaire, I think, covers most of the issues that most people need for state planning and a lot of other things. And uh, we have an economical price for that, uh, about $250 an individual and less than four or $475 for a couple. And, and friends, if you're listening to this, uh, you probably knew where, you'd, where to push play to, to actually start the podcast, but below that you're going to see a whole bunch of paragraphs I refer to those typically as show notes. In the show notes, I'm going to have a link to that page on Scott's website. So if that's something you might be interested in, uh, by all means, just click that link and you'll you'll see the page and and it'll kind of walk you through it. Let me give some free advice to people out here, too, um, about dispensing with probate, the original subject. The Kentucky Administrative Office of the Courts actually have a form for you to do this. And, And you can get onto the website for the Kentucky Administrative Office of the Courts and find this form print it off, fill it out, take it to the clerk's office. Um, and you can do this on your own. We do this for folks. Um, 
we're happy to help you. We got to charge you a fee, and a lot of times it depends on the complexity. Even though these are forms, they can still be fairly complex with a lot of documents involved in them. But um, you can try to do this on your own. This is one of the few things in probate court that I, I think a person might want to attempt on their own as opposed to getting an attorney. Um, even then, the form's a little bit hard to read with a lot of terminology that even some attorneys are unfamiliar with. Um, but um, we do this. We charge a couple hundred dollars when we do it for folks, uh, and there's a filing fee that has to go to the court, too, on top of it. Um, again, you know, this might be one of the few things that I would recommend somebody try as an attorney, without an attorney. The problem is you, you've got to make sure that you don't have anything else. <laughs> and I have seen people go through this process on their own where there was just a car. And then they found out later on, two years later, there might be another car. There might be a bank account or something like that. Well, they didn't include that on the original petition. They had a storage facility somewhere they didn't something. know about. Yeah. 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 And they, St- stuff always pops up. Yeah. And, and now they've got a problem because they've already dismissed with probate, but there's other assets that have to be transferred. Well, now you got to go back and reopen the case and basically start over again with another petition. Uh, so if you are doing this, you got to make sure that you've got all the property listed Otherwise, you maybe end up doing it a couple times and maybe contacting me, and we have to end up charging you more because we got to not only do the petition but also reopen the old one, uh, and it gets real complex. So, um, you know, everybody wants everything over with real fast. I think this is sometimes something that you might want to wait a little bit to see exactly what's out there that was in the decedent's name. Uh, wait till you're sure that there wasn't anything else there else out there. How, well, how long should I wait? Well, I think if you wait a year, you're going to find out if anything was in their name. Somebody's going to send out a bill. Somebody's going to send out some kind of notice that there's this asset out there. Um, usually what I tell folks to do, though, is to wait at least till um, tax season. Because if you wait till tax season, generally anybody that owns an asset, um, they're either going to get taxed on it, either property tax, or they're going to get like a 1099 from the financial institution. Let's say there's a bank account they didn't know about. The financial institution will generally show a 1099 with interest or, or something like that that shows that the decedent had these assets. So if you wait till the end of tax season, usually these assets are going to generate some forms, and um, that'll also be a clue to you that that asset is out there. Another way to do it is looking at the year before taxes, uh, because generally if they had it for a year, it's already going to show up, and you can check that way. But I, I generally tell folks to wait probably till after tax season before they do this. Uh, unless there's a big rush, but that way you, you can get a lot better idea of what's out there. Um, you can find out exactly what needs to be included if you can do this. And you don't have to spend, you know, more money trying to fix the problem that you were trying to fix earlier uh, well, by opening, reopening the petition. And I appreciate that advice because this whole topic, dispensing with probate, is meant to save the surviving yeah, spouse this is money. Yeah, legal advice, trying yeah, to save people yeah, money. We're yeah, we're just trying to save people money. And, yeah. and I love the fact that you're, you're very willing not only to talk to people on the phone, but also to, to provide this kind of information in the podcast or in the blog or other, other uh, forms of information that, uh, that you've done for many, many years. And, and Scott, I, I really admire that about you as, a, as an attorney to be able to say, no, look, you know, um, it's not always just about the money. It, it's about let's help some people. And that really comes through in the way you treat people when, when they come in to, to either talk with you or, or hire you. Well, Rob, I appreciate you saying that. But again, you know, this is something that, again, is one of the few things I think somebody might want to tackle on their own. Um, if somebody has some business background, especially as a CPA accountant, uh, this is probably something they can handle. I've seen some other folks that, uh, uh, you know, don't have as savvy a background, have some difficulties with this. Uh, and if you think that it's too much to handle, holler at us, we'll talk, talk to you about it. We'll try to give you an estimate of what the cost is, and we'll try to take care of you. Uh, but again, um, you know, this is some free legal advice. If you've got a small estate, if you're trying to dispense with probate, there's a form on the AOC, America, excuse me, Administrative Office of the Courts website for Kentucky. You can download, try to do this on your own. And, and I'll put that link in the, in the show notes as well. Yeah, and every clerk in the state of Kentucky charges a different fee, so I'm not going to quote any of those fees <laughs> uh, and, yeah, per county. Um, and you may want to contact the actual um, county clerk's office, uh, probate court part of it, to see what they do with this. Um, Jefferson County, I think, may even have a packet they hand out to people for this. Um, I would assume, you know, some of the bigger counties, Kenton, Fayette, probably deal with this too. Um, some of the smaller counties, you know, if you went to Powell County, you could probably call the clerk and maybe walk you through it. I don't know. But, um, again, uh, this is a way to avoid probate, the cost of probates, the time, and the aggravation of probate if you've got an estate worth less than $30,000. Um, and, again, if there are some expenses that were paid by an individual, uh, for funeral stuff, that can be added to it, which might be another way to increase the actual 
amount that's gone through uh, dispensing with probate. And, and this is the very first thing we look on an estate to see if we can do this to save some folks some money. Fantastic. Scott, I know how busy you are. I appreciate you coming back over to the studio for this episode. And uh, friends, I hope you found this information helpful. I hope you found it uh, interesting. And like we do at the end of a lot of these episodes, I'm going to encourage you, please consider sharing this episode out on your social media. There are a lot of people who need this kind of advice. There are a lot of people out there right now dealing with this and don't know, oh, I, I didn't know that was an option or I didn't know where to turn. Uh, I've known Scott for over 15, almost 20 years now. Uh, he's got a, a practice right, right over there off of Dixie Highway. Fantastic guy to work with. I highly, highly recommend him. And uh, once again, I just uh, would appreciate it if you consider sharing this on your social media. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Louisville Probate Law Podcast with Attorney Scott Shanest. The content provided is for informational purposes only and does not establish an attorney-client relationship. For additional information, visit louisvilleprobatelaw.com.